This video was brought to you by Evergreen. Hey guys, I'm in a motherfucking spaceship, bro. Spectro Heliotic, former leader of the Heliotic Armada and war criminal of the Intergalactic Civil War. Your crimes against the entire universe lay president. The mass genocide of Gargantua Infinity has shaken the universe to its core. The planet remains in ruins, and its denizens have remained poor and hungry due to your reckless actions. How do you plea? I'll do anything to serve my time. I want to hold responsibility for my actions. So, what should I do to atone for my crimes? The justice system on your planet is different from ours, and we shall respect the traditions we hold true. In order for you to atone, you must do the following. To entertain and please the old mother. If you fail, we will come to your home planet and destroy it. This video was made possible by you guys. Ever since the first Disturbing Iceberg was released, it became one of my most popular videos ever. And since there were songs not mentioned in said iceberg that were worthy of a mention, I decided to take it upon myself to search these disturbing songs for myself and put them within this new iceberg I created. This video would have not been possible if not for you guys and because of that, I will make sure to screenshot any comment that was made in the previous video that brought up a song or two that wasn't mentioned previously, but now featured in this iceberg video. This was a hard one to make, and I'm only choosing the most disturbing songs, the cream of the crop. But hopefully I'll cover some in future videos. So with that being said, let's break down another disturbing Vocaloid songs iceberg. What's up? Chrissy, I need your assistance. Find me some more disturbing Vocaloid songs that we haven't covered before. Before the entirety of planet Earth gets destroyed. Sounds good. Wait, what was that last part you said? Layer 1. Kagome Kagome. Produced by Sawazawa P, it is based around a Japanese children's game of the same name. Kagome is Japanese for the word circle, and the point of the game, or ritual, is to have one player stand in the middle of your group as they circle around you as they sing the song. Kagome Kagome's plot revolves around this premise, however, the children playing the game have a very disturbing background. They were abandoned and were tested on by mad scientists who wanted to create an elixir to create immortality and use the children as guinea pigs. However, the elixir causes the children to deform and in revenge, the children murder the scientists. It isn't until they are discovered by us, the viewer, that they become excited by our presence and tell the story of their tragedy. The viewer is encouraged by the children to drink the elixir so that they can become deformed and join the children so that they can play with you forever. This is a very popular song that I'm surprised wasn't in the original Iceberg video that I made a year ago, but I'm glad I finally got to cover this song. The Fox's Wedding Produced by our good old friend Masa, this is the second entry in the story of the Kitsune and the Demon series. According to the Vocaloid Lyrics Wiki, Mai Shisakusa daughter of Ryo Shizukusa, is kidnapped by the members of the Oborodezuka clan and forced to eat human meat. She comes back home the next day and is no longer acting like herself as a result of both the curses that she was previously inflicted on from the previous song, The Spider and the Kitsune-like Lion. She then proceeds to eat multiple members of her own clan before beheading and eating her parents on the day of her birthday party in the middle of an important talk that they were having with her. Again, another song I'm surprised wasn't in the original Iceberg. Hell, the entire Kitsune series should have its own little Iceberg video in itself, but we're just scratching the tip of this Iceberg here. A 13-year-old killer. 
I already talked about this song in my top 5 worst Vocaloid songs, so I'll keep it brief. This song is extremely vague, as most of the track contains nothing more than instrumentals, but some interpretate this song as an android retaliating against the world for treating her like crap. Again, I have a whole video where I talk about this song, so check that out in the link in the description below. Layer 2 2. Mind Brand Did this song just sample the Nostalgia Critic? Welcome to the Mindfuck! Welcome to the Mindfuck! Uh, anyways, this song was produced by Moretu and features Hatsune Miku as she sings about a girl losing her virginity to another man. The song was featured in the Coin Locker Baby album and within the song's narrative, the lyric goes as follows. When, oh when, is it coming out? Pregnant girl, oh pregnant girl. Just some cheap sympathy born from between the sheets. For you, my dear. Though you certainly seem fond of that cynical, mocking attitude, in the end, everyone shall end up in the bottom of hell. They'll all be dragged down there. The visual of this song is also pretty unique, as it's mainly centered around this figure who obviously is supposed to be the girl in question, but by the end of the video, she's seen with her head cut off. Damn. Welcome to the mindfuck. Leia. This tragic song, sung by Luca and produced by Yuyo Yupe, depicts the story of an artist who falls in love with a woman and, in response, paints a picture of the woman. It's suggested that in the song, the artist realizes that their overall being can't live up to the expectations that the painting holds, ultimately feeling as if they can never be with that one person that they hold dear to. And in response, the artist literally ends their own life, and it's implied that the artist even ripped out their own eyes. I don't need these eyes, Leia. The endless illusion laughed sadly. What should I call it? The resounding words are colored in gray. Eternity quietly stopped my breathing and left me in despair. Afterwards, the artist burns themselves alive along with the painting upon the realization that said painting and person could never share or return the same feelings as he once did before. Pinky Swear Although going by the Japanese name, Yubi Kiri, this song was produced by Skop and features Hatsune Miku. The song is about a Japanese tradition involving an I shit you not, a prostitute cutting off their own pinky and delivering it to a client who they fall in love with. If said client were to fall in love with them back, they respond by cutting off their own pinky, but if they don't share the same feelings, they must return the pinky back to their owner. What the fuck, Japan? Layer 3 Yeah, uh, looking at the lyrics to the song, the song already screams disturbing. The frog that I stepped on, eyes came out, rolled and bounced and got inside your mouth. Was that a candy? I saw you were laughing. I pretended not to know. The song was produced by Pepo Yo and features Hatsune Miku. Candy Ball is a fairly short song, running at least a minute and 41 seconds. This cute yet dark song is simply what I just described. It progressively gets worse as we witness what goes on throughout the entire story. Not only does a frog get squished to death, but a group of bullies full of poor salt on a poor little snail and god themselves get involved and punish those below by literally turning the rain into poison, killing anyone exposed to the rain. The song's visuals depict a city backdrop that goes from a normal looking city to a destroyed wasteland. Moral of the story, don't eat frog's eyes or pour salt on snails. Ever want to see Gakuko have a crush on Ren to the point where he just flat out kidnaps her and kills her husband in the process? Well this is the song for you! This song was produced by Uzuki. Gakpo sings about his affection for Rin, and basically locking her in a cage where he'll keep her there as long as he wants. I want you all to myself, so I'll lock you up in a dark room, and even your pretty yellow hair, I want to stain it crimson. Why do the hot ones always have to be the scary ones? 
Shit ain't fair. This song was produced by Ghost and features English vocal aid decks. This is probably one of the most lore heavy songs in the entire iceberg, as it not only tells the story of three different characters, but layered with a ton of religious themes. Okay, so the next part I simply wanted to read out loud because of how ridiculous yet informative the description of the song is, but according to Ghost via the Vocaloid Wiki, Norman Deleuze, Norman is also known as Gay Boy Kisser, Boy Liker, and Gay Wad, and he are fine. His father believes that the world is an awful place and that ascending to the afterlife would be equivalent to waking up from a nightmare. Under this philosophy, he mercy kills his what? Norman himself is a young boy who eats bugs for a living. Ew, what the fuck, Norman? You're nasty as fuck! And can never see God. They can never see since God has taken his glasses away. Growing up with this mindset, he questions whether things are real, as if the world is some elaborate setup, and in order to wake up, one needs to pass away. He becomes a substance abuser to deal with this process, but eventually decides that it's time to grow up and pull a plug, feeling that everyone would be alright if he could escape the real world. Afterwards, he meets God, and Charon, Charon's a twink-ass spider, what the hell, God confirms Norman, Norman's suspicions, but clarifies that there's so much more to the situation that meets the eye. He advises Norman to stay by his side so he could show him the truth. But because Norman's father was essentially the heart of this reality, God eats father both as the notion of ending the simulation and taking his place as the new caretaker. Charon instead offers an easy, him an easier way out by a kiss. They both want it to pl for pleasure too, let's be honest here. They're more than, than just a tad bit fruity. They're the whole fucking fruit basket, which would poison him. Norman leaves everything behind, wanting to forget all about it. However, upon waking up, it is learned that the real wor world's Norman body was being used for public vivisection. Vi viv sex viv section Christ Spectro put some like annotations here <laughs> in front of a large audience of angels also just letting you know that Norman's a gay twink and what the flip is he isn't slick at all oh no -uh. sweet Jesus that was interesting before Ghost's Twitter account was deleted and yes I refuse to call it X Ghost had an interest and expanding and continuing the story of Honey, I'm Home by developing it into an RPG based around the song. Interface. It's time to return to our old friend Masaworks design, as this song in particular was not only disturbing, but it's also considered lost media. Interface was originally released back in 2011 and then deleted by Masa, which, if you saw Vectro's last video talking about Masaworks design, most of the discography has been taken down by the producer. Only thumbnails relating to the song exist on the internet, which only includes a 10 a second snippet of the song, which I'll play for you right now. From what past listeners have stated, the song is basically loose-ended and only fan interpretations have pointed out the idea of, that the song is about a schoolgirl portrayed by Kagamine Ren killing her fellow classmate played by Miku. In 2023, a remake by Shermie P was uploaded to YouTube, and I gotta say, the dedication made by this creator is astounding, and the overall attention this song is getting is enough to stir this piece of lost media. I hope one day the original gets found, but for now, we'll settle on this remake. According to the producer of the song R.I.P., this song is essentially a body horror using mushrooms as a metaphor. To keep this portion of the video as simple and clean, how do I interpret this song as simply a metaphor for body imagery and character, but also the way it tells a story of an individual who feels like their body is not their own, and that their mindset has rotted to the point where they cannot control themselves. I feel like this can be a metaphor for anything to be honest whether it can be OCD, gender identity, etc. As someone 
who has BPD. I personally understand the song's messages, but seem to find relatability to this track through other points to view. But if we were to take the song out of a metatextual meta narrative, we can also see this, this as a song where a girl transforms into this cordyceps-like creature being hunted down by those who fear her, despite the individual never asking to be this way. Another fruiting body sprouts out of my skin. A tiny opportunity planted within. Now look away. I'm gonna be sick, sick, sick. I'm not one to cry, but I haven't been unable to since. They're coming after me. I can't run away. They hear me screaming in fear. They think it's hilarious. Layer 4. Paparazzi Murder Party. Ah, what's this? Another song about the murder of another Vocaloid? Gee, what a surprise! Produced by Vane and features in the voice of Gumi, the song is about a stalker who goes about their way and murders a celebrity during a party. To make matters even worse, the killer decides to rip open their victim's heart and post a picture on it for internet clout. Down a shot, let's get it started. Grab your camera, lock on target. Take a photo, take their lifeline, cry for help, well now she's lying. It's just call it as it is, yeah? I just call it as it is. A stupid bitch with pretty lies. Dance of the Corpse Another song by Kikwo. This song is about the idea of the afterlife and how the only way out of this painful reality is death. By dancing with the unliving, eternal peace will only be satisfied if you simply just leave this miserable world behind. Let's follow the lead of the corpse and dance. The dance of the corpses. Let's follow the lead of the corpses and dance. Something which has become possessed has become an unwilling traveler on the path to the underworld. Hatred and malice will gladly share in this joyful journey. I think there's really no need to elaborate more since this is one of those just interpretate the way you like it type deals and overall, not a bad song. Kalalini. From the mind of Crusher and sung by Kayuki, this song is based off of a real life individual by the name of Jenny Schofield. Her story was that while growing up in California, she suffered from a series of nightmares, paranoid episodes, and hallucinations. This was all while she was just 6 years old, but not only that, she had suffered these series of episodes since the day she was born, being labeled as the first person to be diagnosed with schizophrenia at a young age. Not only that, but she created a world for herself in the form of Kalalini, the subject of our entry. This world was also inhabited by the many creatures she saw when she was 3 years old. In 2008, Janie's parents, Michael and Susan, helped create a website called the Janie Foundation in order to raise awareness of Janie's mental health. This attention got them to appear on the Oprah Winfrey show as well as Dr. Phil. And this is when shit gets really weird. In 2019, there had been allegations that her mental health had been debunked by Janie's father out of all people. This was due to their mother Susan influencing Moonshanson by proxy towards Janie and her brother Bodie. Hell, at one point, Susan had their own YouTube channel which was a subject of criticism and ridicule to the point where Kiwi Farms got involved. Yeah, the same Kiwi Farms that was once known as the Chris Chan Quickie Forums. Not trying to give them any attention or any praise because they're not good people either, but yeah. That's how crazy the story gets. Michael would eventually divorce Susan and move to Minnesota in which he started a new life and got remarried. As for Susan, she eventually became president of the Janney Foundation. In the case of Janney and her brother, due to CPS getting involved, the two siblings were separated from their parents, with Janney living in a group home while Bodie was moved into a secondary foster family, whose first foster family was allegedly abused and harassed by Susan herself. This story is just super sad, and if there's anything I can talk about this song is the fact that the lyrics are just descriptions of the characters and world that Janie had built for herself. But we're not done just yet. You see, back in 2013, Susan and Michael had actually discovered the song, and you'd think by extension, they would be angered by this. Well, that was the complete opposite. 
Instead, they contacted the producer in hopes they could market off of it with t-shirts and other forms of merchandise in order to raise money for the Janie Foundation. According to Michael himself, he didn't find the song offensive in any nature. However, that didn't stop Crusher from realizing that there was a lot of shady stuff going on behind the scenes. And because of that, Crusher backed out of the deal and wished no further collaborations with the family. According to the Vocaloid Wiki, in August 2017, the producer stated that there would be a rewrite of the song using Kaiyuki V4 as they hated the lyrics of the original and remembered that Planty P, a controversial Vocaloid user, did the mixing for the original. This version is found on the Conciencia album. Crusher later apologized for its inclusion to the album as they explained that they wanted the chance to rewrite it in something far better. However, they acknowledged that no matter how many times they made rewrites of it, the original context and connotations would always be a part of it. It was later removed in the free upload of the album via Crusher's website, but streaming services featuring the album will still contain it. This is due to Crusher not having any control nor rights over the album. Like the claim regarding profit from the project and apparel merchandise, Crusher made no profit through the album either. A really messed up situation after another and I gotta say, I really feel bad for Crusher and the type of shit that they had to deal with. This is probably a topic worth of a video on its own but I just wanted to throw it in because of just how batshit insane this whole situation was. Coin Locker Baby this is an actual term for victims of abuse within the Japanese community, and just as the name suggests, it refers to the concept of literally shoving an infant in a locker. And all I gotta say is that there's a whole lot about it that I can't really say because YouTube strict policies, but all you need to know is that due to these infants being locked up in these public lockers for a long period of time, of course this results in tragic passings of these children. This song was produced by Moretu and literally just is ah oh, just 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 look at these lyrics. That's the newborn heart I tried to lock up by stuffing it full of this imagined happiness. The feelings you scrape out of your throat get gathered up and go right into the locker. And then the song ends with these chilling lyrics. With a smile on your face as you dozed off, you went cold. What can we do? Produced by Daijobu P, this disturbing looking song appears to depict a girl portrayed by Miku who finds amusement and pleasure in drugs and sexual thrills. The visuals are trippy as all hell and for whatever reason, this song just makes me feel sick just looking at it. I mean, the visuals and just listening to it just it just oh, makes me just makes me want to throw up. Like, man. Like, I'm not- I'm not exaggerating, like, while making this video and looking at the visuals, like, oh my- I- I- I honestly felt like I was gonna throw up. Like, I'm already sick recording this at this point, but, damn. Layer 5. September. Hey, a song made by the Living Tombstone! While I'm not a brony myself, it is interesting to see a song relating to ponies and Vocaloid all at once. Sung by Oliver, this song tells the story of a lonely pony who ponders alone, wondering where all their friends have gone. Possessing a short memory and following simple clues leading up to the big reveal, which turns out that our main character had killed their friends in cold blood. Crayon Based on the horror story, The Red Crayon, it tells the tale of a child who is confined to a chamber and all they have with them is a red crayon in which they write down on the walls, leaving a message that concludes when the child eventually and sadly dies. To give it a full extent of the story used in the original story, here's how it all transpires. A couple moved into the place that the child died in. They one day found the red crayon but were confused since they didn't have any children. They soon realized that almost every single day since their move, they've been finding red crayons at the end of their hallway. Investigating further, they noticed that one of the wallpapers was peeling off, and after tearing it, they found a sliding door, which was nailed shut. Taking down the nails, they found a room with red scribbles of the words, Mommy, I'm sorry, let me out. Wide knowledge of the late madness.
as someone who is super paranoid, this is going to really make my skin crawl. And look, I'm in the far reaches of the universe, but I'm already losing my shit. It's not because of the song itself, but what the author of the wiki has to say about it. I heard scary noises in the night when I was finishing this. Yep, that's my cue to get the fuck out of here! Produced by Machiere P, the song tells the story about people at a mental asylum where everyone meets the same fate. Each day a person is killed and the patients claim that they're being delighted to die. However, in the end, they call out in desperation for someone to save them. The Experiment Produced by Steam Pianist, this song is based off of the infamous creepypasta, The Russian Sleep Experiment. If you're not aware of that story, it's about an experiment that was conducted towards five individuals. And again, don't worry, creepypastas are fake, they're not real. The experiment was to test a stimulant that would be released onto the test subjects to see how long they could stay awake, which resulted in a series of disturbing outcomes. This series of experiments would last for 15 days one of which were violent screams that were so loud it tore the vocal cords of the test subjects and the most famous results, the, the subjects who would fall asleep would end up dying in their sleep. This resulted in the subjects literally suffering from manic episodes and the transformation of their bodies to pure and disturbing unrecognition. The song is essentially an adaptation of this story. Also, fun fact, this image linked to the Russian sleep experiment is actually a photo from a Halloween prop. Layer 6 Jisatsu Shoujo I... uh... what is this song? The lyrics are just elements of endgaming yourself and a ton of other dark themes. But good god, what's up with the visuals? Miku looks like a deep fried Kermit the Frog! Six minutes? Six minutes of this? Holy hell! Specimen Girl Yet another creepy ass Gakubo song, produced by Kiyozumi, the lyrics goes as follows. Let's gouge out your eyes. That way, you won't look at anyone else. Let's cut off your hands and feet. That way, you won't touch anyone else. Why did you, although I am here, sleep with another man? That's the punishment for the crime you committed. I'm not letting you go anywhere anymore. From today, you are my specimen. I could fix him. Sir, sir. <laughs> Grab me that specimen. But sir, we don't really know what it is. Grab me that specimen. A stranger is dying somewhere. This is actually a pretty sad and interesting song by Nashimoto P, which focuses on the idea and perception that every single day, Every single minute that passes, someone out there is dead or being killed as we speak. Earth is a big place filled with all sorts of things going on. It's not shocking that almost every day according to the CDC, in 2017, an average of 7,708 deaths occur each day. People are dying somewhere. It doesn't matter to me at all, but people are dying somewhere, having no time to despise myself. I breathe in this small room. Ah, I'm sorry I'm happy somehow. The singer obviously has words of regret in terms of their existence. They realize that death is inevitable, but while they're still young and able to do all sorts of things, some people aren't so fortunate as death is simply waiting for them and that their time has come whether they like it or not. As scary as it is, death is natural and that's just how things are in life. It sucks, but as the saying goes, we were literally born to die, but honestly, just live life to the fullest. It's a beautiful world we live in, even if it's bleak and dark at times, simply enjoy yourself as much as you can. Black and White Ward Produced by Yugami P, this is their second song ever created. According to the producer, the story is about Rin who died and another Rin who is still alive. According to the Vocaloid Synthesizer Wiki, Len and Rin's corpses are going to be exchanged. Len has been hospitalized due to heart failure and Rin comes to visit him. She brings a music box with her and when Len asks her if there was a way out, she replies, there. 
Len gets desperate to become discharged from the hospital and is implied to have tried to run away. In hopes to getting his needed heart, he stabs Rin fatally so she can become his donor. As he kills her, he hears a woman's voice telling him to be wary of what he sees in the corner of his eyes. After the transplant is finished, Len awakens, speaking in Rin's voice. Even though you said the corpses were going to be exchanged. Forced Obedience Produced by Moretu, this song is about- Do I need to say more? The lyrics goes as follows. At least the lyrics that truly justify its disturbing contents. I continue to be- My sister continues to be- You continue to be pleased. We are soaked in tears, coercing self-righteous compilation. This biased relationship continues. It's so difficult. I want you to just let me die. Please don't trample over our bodies anymore. The next songs on this layer will cover works from producer Sekai, as they are a part of a saga of songs that depict very disturbing imagery and topics. If you're familiar with this producer, as well as their works, congratulations. But if not, prepare yourself. Our Anniversary Our Anniversary depicts the dismemberment of Kagamine Len acted upon by Hatsune Miku. It then spirals into a series of disturbing imagery of Miku and loud, distorted music. The song ends with Len and Miku laying on a field of grass as it fades into a sampling of Ode to Joy. And then a jump scare. <laughs> The song is likely themed around Len bullying Miku and Miku retaliating against him in a very violent manner. My Date Continuing from the events of our anniversary, we see Miku laying in the same field from the previous video. However, we see her walking through a hallway as she sings about how she's grown to hate the world and having to live in an unfaithful reality. As she walks, her destination leads her into a black void where chaos and more disturbing imagery ensue. She then walks to a door leading into her room, which leads us to our final song in this disturbing saga. My Death Day This depicts Miku celebrating her birthday, or in this case, her death day. Because she wishes she was never born, the song describes different ways on how she wants to endgame herself in graphic detail. Speaking of details, like every song produced by Sekai, you have some pretty disturbing visuals, especially this picture of Miku that pops in at the 5 minute mark. <laughs> It 
it just stays there looking into your soul. Like, hey, I heard you like living. You have failed to please me. Your topics have perverse me. Prepare for your reckoning. There once was a planet called Gargantua Infinity. It was a ginormous planet, home to all known civilization across the universe. Unfortunately, war had broke out on that planet, thus commencing the intergalactic civil war. And during my time as a space pirate, the war was a mere distraction for my grand scheme, which was to steal the planet's most prized possession. I thought that whatever they were hiding could possess more fortune than I could ever imagine. But what I ended up finding wasn't treasure. It was a bomb. The All Mother has spoken. Any last words, space pirate? Ever since I came back to Earth, I tried to find myself. But no matter where I go, she always finds me. And I can no longer stand it. So I came back for the All Mother. Ugh. 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 So this wasn't about the war. It was about the All Mother. You have officially crossed the line. We have watched you for some time. And we will not stand for it. Stand. Down. You can kill me and get away with it. But no matter what, the All Mother will always be by your side, watching you until the day you perish. I am done running. The universe will always be against me. And that's fine. I realize that all life in the universe has its flaws. But it also has its beauty. For once, why can't... The All Mother has been vanquished. Thank you, Spectral. Yeah, don't mention it. Just gather your people and expose the truth about the All Mother. Oh no. I have made a grave mistake. Indeed I have. What are you talking about? Regardless of what fate has set forward for you, Earth will inevitably be destroyed. What? Yes, and it is all due to my negligence. Regardless if you return to Earth, it will already be in shambles. But we can stop this, right? I'm afraid not. Oh, fuck. It also appears that a friend of yours has gone missing. What? You gotta be fucking kidding me. What is going on?
are you here, and how did you find me? We both know that answer, Joshua. Or should I call you Cobalt King? You killed one of my top agents. I'm not gonna let that slide. How about we talk about over a nice cup of tea? Just like the good old days. I've noticed you're not wearing your ring anymore, Director. Goddamn knees! Where the fuck are we now? Apparently we're outside. I have magic this entire time? You would have known if you read my fucking book! I can't fucking read! That's not my problem! Oh, come on, don't start now! You're not dealing with magic powers, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 